1 Timothy chapter number 6, we're going to start reading down in verse number 17. <clears throat> it says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, and they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Old Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have, er or have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for this day. Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, we're just so thankful that we have a church to be able to come to. Lord, we're thankful for this freedom that we still enjoy. Lord, just to be able to come out here tonight and worship you. Lord, I ask you just help me now. Lord, what you laid upon my heart, Lord, just hide me behind you. Just help me here to give it to your people, Lord, the way you gave it to me. Lord, as you just help help meet with us tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the first thing I want to look at by way of introduction is we see in verse number 17, he talks about the charge. Charge them that are rich in this world. Notice he doesn't say anything, there's anything wrong with being rich. He doesn't say if you have things, there's anything wrong with that. But the fact is of not to be high-minded or trust in what does it say next? Those uncertain riches. Our problem isn't if we have riches, it's the problem we get to where we trust in those things. We trust in that stuff we have in the world instead of trusting in the things of God. The second thing I'll look at as we see at the end of verse number 18, he talks about, and you see that word communicate, they that do good and they that be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. We should be thankful for tonight that we have a way to communicate with Him. We have that prayer. We have His Word. We have those ways that we're going through things and we're dealing with tough situations. We're, we Things we think may look dire that we have that way to communicate with them. How well do we communicate that with others? How well do we get that, uh, uh, that point across to the lost world uh, how they need to be saved? How well do we get it uh, to that lost world of, that we have something that they need? Not only do we see the communicate, we see uh, then again in verse, number <clears throat> in verse number 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. How committed are we? And we'll get into that a little bit later here, just a little bit. But how committed are we? How committed are we to the things of God? A pastor talked about, well, some of the things that are going on in this world. We talked about last year all the things that were going on uh, with COVID, and we, we say that we're completely committed to God, but too many times all it takes is just a slight little thing that will get us out of church. The slight little thing will keep us from reading our, our, our Bible daily or, or, or doing something for God that we do on a daily basis. And the last thing, by way of introductions, we see in verse 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Concerning our faith. I looked up a couple things. Now, granted, keep in mind, this is just the average person. I know, Sister Mary, what I'm, supposed to, what I'm about to say here, the first thing I'm going to say, you might spend 80 hours a week sleeping. But the average person spends 60 hours a week sleeping. Now, if you're like me, Pastor, you love to get 60 hours a week sleeping. But the average person spends 60 hours a week sleeping. They spend seven hours a week eating. Mine's about flipped. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> the average person... Spends 37 hours a week working and three and a half hours getting ready. Now, I don't spend near that time getting ready, but some people are going to spend a whole lot more. But those four things, Brother Phil, just those four things, take up over 60% of our time on a weekly basis. Now, if you come to Emmanuel Baptist Church, if you come here each and every time that the doors are open, if you come early to pray, and we get out at an average time, on an average service, when we get out normally, you spend the same amount of time in church that you do eating in a week. You think that's enough? Is that enough time you think spending with God that you will spend enough time in church that you do spending time outside of there eating? And remember, that's only if you eat 25 minutes a day, or right around 30 minutes a day. You think that's enough? See, when it comes to our faith, we don't spend near enough time with him outside of here as we need to. Let me tell you a little bit about where this thought come from. Pastor asked me on Sunday when I left Sunday morning if I wanted to preach Wednesday night. 
So we left here and we was driving to Toledo. We was going up to the Solheim Cup. If you don't know what that is, 12 lady golfers from the U.S. against 12 women golfers from Europe. They play in a tournament every other year. That's what it's called. This is probably the closest to us it will ever be. So we drove up there to watch the singles matches on Monday. So I left out of here and I'm thinking all the way up there, God, what do you have me preach? Is it something I have in my notes already? Is it something else you've already given me? We got up to the hotel room. I started reading, going through things. And then I'm thinking on the way home. I had something on the way home, driving about 9 o'clock, uh, coming back Monday night. Or, yeah, it's Monday night. I'm all messed up on my days. Driving back home Monday night, and, and I, I, God starts dealing with my heart about this thought as somebody's passing me, and then I'm passing them, and then they're passing me, and then I'm passing them. Now, see, how much we spend so much time out in this world, as Pastor just talked about, Hollywood can do whatever they want. We don't have to let it influence us. We spend so much time out in this world, Brother Phil, I'm afraid too much of that has influenced us when it comes to in here. Because we think that if we come to church, that's good enough. We've gotten to the point in our lives and concerning the faith that we believe, well, as long as I'm in church, I'm good. It's not, this is nowhere close to being enough. Because as we already said, we spend way more time out there than we do in here. So what I want to preach on with God's help is a worldly mindset. Too many times we have a worldly mindset. Things that we do in the world has slid in to our mindset when it comes to the things of God. The first one, I just alluded to it a little bit, and this is where it all came from. We have no predictability. I don't remember my very first car was a 79 Dodge Aspen, Brother Brian. I have no idea if I had cruise or not. I don't remember being on the interstate that much with it. But now that I drive, I love cruise control. And if you don't use it, you get on my nerves. And that's where this all started. Is I, I, You know, you have a car, I'm coming home Monday night, and I pass them, and five miles later, here they are passing me back. And then five miles later, I'm passing them back. And then five miles later, passing. That's how we are here. Oh, God, I'm going to do this for you. We come to the end of service, we have a great revival meeting or a great camp meeting, and we come up and we're praying crocodile tears. God, I want to do anything for you. Then can't find us for a month. I, I, I guarantee that if I went back and asked Pastor, he could probably easily name off a list of top ten things. People have come to him and said, hey, I'm going to do this, and they never do anything. We have no predictability. We, 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 we say that we have plans. We say that we're going to do this. We never do anything. What did Peter tell, what, what did Peter tell Christ? I will go to, with you to the cross. And that very night, what did he do? He denied him three times. We have no predictability. We just, we just do whatever we seem to think feels good, in the moment. And see, when, we, when, when all we have is in that moment is here, that's what happens. Because we don't spend that time outside of here to, to grow in the Lord, and we, we make those emotional decisions in a church. I remember our pastors told a story about, uh, I believe it was at a, a camp meeting or a revival, and a guy coming up and telling him that night he was going to be, I believe it was a missionary that night, and it was an evangelist by the next morning. What was that all about? How much time are we spending with God because we have no predictability. The second thing, we seem to just sense no pressure. When you watch professional sports and you, and you, you watch anything on TV, whether, no matter what the sport is, they always talk about, uh, Brother Jim, about not feeling the pressure. They don't feel the pressure. Well, they, they are great in the clutch. Can I tell you that we are in the clutch? We are at that time. You know, I had that song that I, that I heard last year. It talks about the midnight hours coming, and it's 11.59. Are we feeling the pressure to get out to a lost and dying world that they need Christ? I, I, I am not, Look, I, I appreciate tremendously the work that goes on in our church. I, I'm, I'm not taking that for granted. I'm not trying to throw off on anybody here. But you realize that we go out on Monday nights on visitation. One person is all it takes to keep up with the amount of tracks that we pass out. We have one person that stuff bags for us. And I, I, and I know this person, they might, we might be able to pass out a thousand more and she can still keep up. That's what she likes to do. That's possible. But that's it. One night. How much pressure do we truly feel? Pastor has said from this pulpit many times, if Monday night doesn't work from you, you let me know. I'm sure we can find a group to go with you any time that you want to go. Unfortunately, Brother Donald, probably what happens is I go say, hey, Pastor, Monday nights don't work for me anymore. I do Thursday. And most of the Thursday night's crowd is going to be the same ones that go on Monday night. They're just going to go on Thursday also. 
How much pressure are we truly feeling when we can't get the whole church to show up to go? Now, I know some can't go. I understand that. But we could do something. Maybe just show up to pray. Maybe you show up. Maybe you need to ask, hey, what do I need to do? Stuff tracks, whatever it may be. How much pressure are we truly feeling that we're in the last minutes of the last days for Christ returns? We've done had two people tonight talk about praying for the loved ones. We all could probably raise our hand that we have loved ones that need to be saved. Are we feeling that pressure that we need to truly pray and be sincere and, 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 be, and just get hold of the horns of the altar and beg God to save them before it's too late? How much pressure are we truly feeling? If we don't feel it out there, we will have to come in here. We've, all, we've heard it preached, and we've heard it said, and yes, we believe Jesus is coming back and, and whatever it may be or whatever. We don't feel any pressure. The third thing that too many times is how we out there... We have no problem fitting in. I've noticed over, I got thinking about this today at work. This is just, just me talking in my, my life. I've noticed that those people that are from about 30 and under, Brother Donald, they don't care if you go to church. They're going to say whatever four-letter word they want to. They're going to say whatever they want to around you. It doesn't matter to them. Once you get over 30 or 40, We'll have a little more respect for Brother Phil. They might even, if they say a four-letter word or something, they say, my bad, Brother Josh, forgot you go to church. And if you're like me, this is me preaching to me, too many times, I understand, it happens, whatever. When was the last time we said, yeah, just do better? Just, just don't say it around me. You know I go to, you know this, you know I go to church, you know? Well, just do better. But instead, we just like to fit in. We just, we just like to fit in whatever it is. And see, and, and, and it doesn't, we are too worried that we might stand out. You all know what I just told you we went to, we went to the Solheim Cup on Monday. You know I like to play golf. Miss Lisa, if you thought that pair of pants I had was hideous, you should have seen what some of those people up there were dressed in. They didn't have a care in the world. You could ask Caitlin, you could ask T even Tina. Like, there are some things, Brother Jim, I will wear just about anything on the golf course. Some of that stuff up there, I wouldn't have worn if I was by myself on the only golf course left in the world. I wouldn't have been caught dead in some of that stuff. But they felt like they just fit in because they just felt like they were being patriotic. They didn't care that they stood out. Why do we care so much if we stand out? Why do we go out into a world and we're so worried about standing out that we're not willing to just say No. This, this, this isn't going to happen. And I'm afraid, I'm not old enough to, re, you know, I, I don't, I'm not old enough to know when they took prayer out of schools and all those kinds of things, but I'm afraid we have just uh, set by too often and not wanted to take a stand for things. That's why we're in the situation we are now of why I see all those people that are about 30 or so and younger that I may work with don't know anything about church. They don't know anything about whatever. I talk about going to church last week. Somebody said, what time do you get out of church? I'm like, I don't know, 12, 30, 12, 45. What time do you go? What do you mean what time do I go? Sunday school starts at 10, church starts at 11. Oh, my goodness. You're in church that long? Yeah. Praise God, show up. We're in there even longer. Yeah. But they have no clue, no concept when you try to talk to them. Why? Because we just try to fit in. We're not willing to stand out when we get out there. We've allowed, we've allowed that worldly uh, just mindset that we just went, we can't offend anybody. They have no problem offending us. I mean, he just said it. They have no problem doing anything to offend us. Well, if we offend them, so be it. Here's what it is. You need to get saved. You're going to die and go to hell. End of story. You know, I, I don't want to sound rude or hateful coming across, but that's what it's coming down. That's what it comes down to. No problem fitting in. The fourth thing, a worldly mindset. We just have no plan. That was the, 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 the fun thing about going up there on Monday it is uh, Tina and, and Bella went with us, and neither one of them liked golf. So at one point, they just finally found a shade tree and just sat down underneath the shade tree. Me and Caitlin, we just walked around. We just we followed this person here, then we just cut across. We've both played on the golf course before, so we just cut across four holes, go watch people here, and just go here and go there. And we, we just had no plan. That's how are when it comes to things of God. We just have no plan. Do you realize each and every one of us in here, from the youngest to the oldest, God has a plan for your life? What did Paul ask him when, when Paul was on that road to Damascus? What did, he looked up, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? When was the last time you asked God that question? 
When was the last time you said, God, what is it you want me to do? Yes, I might be older. Yes, I might not be able to, to go out on visitation, but I can pray. God, I might not be able to do this or do that, but I could, you could be like Sister May and send birthday cards. You, could, you can be like the person just come in and pray early. You might be able to come and help uh, uh, clean the church or water the flowers or mow the yard, whatever it may be. When was the last time you sought God's will for your life? Colton came down there and sat down there next to me. I was asking him about school. I was asking him what he wanted to do when he grew up. And we just had a little conversation right there. And that we, we give thought to a lot of those things. What, what, what am I going to do? When was the last time you asked God, God, what is it you want me to do? God, what, what, what path would you have me on in my life? Not what my plan is. God, what's your plan? Reveal your plan to me and get in his word. You're not going to get his plan coming to church a few hours every week. It's going to require you to get into the book and seek God's face and, and ask God and really truly seek what he wants for your life. But too many times we just go, we have no plan. We're just, we'll run around here and there and do whatever. and We'll skip from church to church or, or whatever it may be, giving no thought to what God truly has for our life. You know, as I you know, remember back when we had the, the totes and I've made this comment before, just taking that blank piece of paper and just saying, God, whatever it is you want me to do. I want to do it. When was the last time we just said, God, whatever you want me to do? Because too many times we might pray, God, what does you want me to do with my life? And in the back of my head, I'm already taking those top five things that he might want me to do and marking them off. But I'm not going to do this, 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 this. Because of this reason, this reason, this reason, or this reason. What if that's what God wants you to do? What if you have no clue how God can use you? And we'll get to that here in a little bit too. We have no plan. The fifth thing, is we think we have no power. This world has no power. Why do we act the same way? Do we, not sing the, do we not sing the song, there is power in the blood? Do we not believe and make the statement, there is power in prayer? Why do we live otherwise? Why do we walk through our day acting like we don't serve a living Savior who created this world? We could go outside and look around now and think everything we see around us, God created you think of the things that we have seen yeah i think of uh, and, and uh, i apologize for not remembering it. i believe it might have been i uh, believe it was last year as well sister lynn couldn't sing come up ask the church to pray for was it two days later she came up here and sang but see we we tend to think that if something don't happen right away it's never going to happen and we give up do we not realize there is power how many days did david stay and sit and pray for that that child that he wouldn't die. See, we've already got it made up, I'm afraid, too many times in our mind that we know what's going to happen. No, we don't know what's going to happen. God does. But it's going to happen on his timeline. But we are to be the ones that pray. I was thinking about this today. I, I, I hate using anybody, certain things as an example because I don't want to embarrass anybody. Sister Brittany would come in here. Miss Lynn would come in here and request prayer for Brandon. Many times, request prayer for Brandon. What if they had given up praying? Not just the fact that they given up, because it, it wasn't Sister Brittany, it wasn't Sister Lynn that asked Brother Doug to call. Was it Jackson or Owen? Jackson is the one that asked Brother Doug to call. If they had quit praying before Jackson had ever been around, Jackson wouldn't have known that we're praying for, for, for uh, uh, Brother Brandon to, to get back in church. And what did he do? See, not only some of his kids saved, but the whole family be back in church. See, there is power in prayer. Why do we, we have allowed, we get so wrapped up in politics and out there and think, oh, we can't change anything. We've allowed it to seep into here that we think we can't change anything. We don't know what we can do when we'll get down and spend the time with God that it's going to require to see things change. God might know the outcome, but we don't. God just might be waiting on that last prayer that before you give up, that may do something to change. Not only do we have no power, we think we have no power, we have no purposeful hearing. This is where I'm afraid that I'm going to make some people mad. And I really don't mean to. Our sports stars, we hear so much about them, they can just turn it on come playoff time. Do we sit in here and do we think we can just turn it on come preaching time? The reason I ask this, and 
I was thinking about this today, and I was going to say this, try to you know, point finger at myself also. How many times does a pastor stand up here and give announcements, and he'll, he'll say something in announcements, and I don't know how many times I've even had people ask me, what did Brother Doug say? Well, the only wild thing, the problem is, Donald, is I have to make sure I'm listening because then I'm going to have to answer. I'm going to be look like stupid too, like I didn't listen, right? So we sat in here with 3,000 things on our mind, looking into space, looking into this, looking into whatever, not giving a second thought when he does announcements. Do we just turn it on when preaching starts? Or do we just stay in the same little zombie states on what goes on? I've heard pastors say this. I've thought of this before. Uh, I taught Sister Kathy Sunday school uh, uh, class here at a, probably a month or six weeks or whatever it was ago, and I remember the kids talking about that they could tell us. What's the chances? We get done preaching tonight, we walk outside, and everybody stands, and they congregate, and everybody talks, and you're going to talk longer tonight because Brother Josh is preaching, so it's not going to be quite as long, so you're going to think, hey, we have more time to fellowship afterwards. What's the chance that we get to the parking lot before you get in your car and say, what did I preach on tonight? What text did I give? Do we have any kind of purposeful, purposeful hearing? We get into the world, and, and we, how many times do we, and, and I'm just as guilty of this, Brother Jim, as anybody, you, you take somebody and you, you go order food somewhere, and they, they hand you your food and they'll say, you know, enjoy your meal. You too. They're not eating. They're working. Because we didn't listen to what they said. We, just, we already had in our mind, Brother Donald, the response we was going to give back. And I'm afraid too many times that's how we get in here. We already have in our mind the response we're going to give. Well, if we, get, if, we, if we hear so many amens, we might go to the altar. If somebody really gets convicted and starts crying, we might go to the altar. If he just stands up and preaches like normal, you know, I, I might say an amen, we're going to go out, and we're, we just got to worry about what we're going to eat afterwards. We have no purposeful hearing. Can I say, if we had true purposeful hearing, we wouldn't have to be planning on a building program. We'd have already had to build. Because purposeful hearing and not doing that is what led so many that has been here not here now. I am thankful for the preachers we have. I've been here for 20 years. I've seen multiple men come in and out our congregation, surrender to preach, set in preacher's classes with us that our pastor taught, said, be wary of this, don't do this, and six months later, them go do the same thing that they was just told not to do, Brother Phil. Just jump in. I'm not perfect. I might do the same thing tomorrow. I'm not perfect by any stretch, but we don't have any purposeful hearing. We just do the same thing in the world that we do here, in one ear and out the other. We can tell our kids something until they're blue in the face. I feel like God is the same way with us. That we got to stand up and the preacher has to preach the same message uh, uh, morning and evening if he had to, frontwards and backwards. And it's like it said before that they, he talked about the pastor before, we wouldn't notice because we didn't pay attention in the first place. We have no purposeful hearing. Let me say this lastly. I'm a little bit past 7.30, my bad. As I talked about, we went to the Solheim Cup. A lot of those people were dressed out like crazy, Brother Donald, like I said. Why? They were just beyond to be patriotic. You know why, Sister Mary? Because they had pride in their country. And I say, we have no pride. The problem is, here's the pride we got. I'm going to sit right here and I ain't changing no matter what. I don't care what goes on. I don't care what he preaches. I ain't doing that. I ain't coming to visitation. I ain't doing this. I ain't doing that. That's the kind of pride that we have. What happened to the pride we have? Yes, I go to church. Yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, this is who I am. Yes, I serve a risen Savior, and that's what you need in your life as well. See, so we have no pride when it comes to the things of God. We just want to just roll off our tongue, just want to say, oh yeah, I go to church like it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal. Those people out there that we deal with on a daily basis, they need what we have. But we take no pride in this. If you took pride in our faith the same way we do in other things, where would we be, not even individually, but where could we be as a church? When we take pride in things out there, we put all our time and effort into it. I don't take great pride in my yard, 
but I've worked hard at least over the 20 years that we've been there to try to at least have a decent looking yard. And it really doesn't matter. It's going to burn up. But I still want it to look good when people drive down, you know? When, when, it, when you have that month of July and it's hot and dry and everybody else's yard turns brown, I want mine to at least be green for a, maybe a week longer, Brother Jim, than everybody else's. What do we do with our Christian life? What do we do in our heart? What do we do in our mind? If all the time and effort you put concerning your faith is the time that you spend here, you're not taking much pride in your faith. If you don't spend time outside these walls, in the book, spend time praying, spend time with the Lord, and it might just be driving. It just might be driving down the road, turn all the music off, just and say, God, what does you have me to do? God, show me some things. God, bring back remembrance some of those scriptures that I've been uh, that, that you've led me to and I've studied or I've read or whatever it may be. But see, we don't take pride in our faith. We take pride in the other things that ever in the world's going to see. But we don't take pride in our faith and truly exercising and putting the time into it that we should. I said at the beginning, those four things we spend over 60% of our time doing. You know what that doesn't include? I never said nothing about you driving back and forth to work. Never said nothing about the time you spend watching TV, possibly. I never said nothing about the time you're doing yard work, you're doing housework, the time you're taking to cook and prepare that food. So thank you just add those few things on. How much more time that takes away from us spending time with God. So that's why if we're going to do anything for Him, we must take pride in that time that we spend to study. Because if we don't, it's doing us no good. Reading and studying your Bible isn't about just opening up and reading three verses and closing it. That gets us nowhere. I'm afraid that gets us in the condition that we're in today because we've not taken pride in our faith. We allow the world just to walk all over us, do whatever they want. And I'm not talking about being prideful and being hateful or anything like that. Just saying, no, these are some things that we have, we have to stand up for. We have to stand on taking pride and no you're you're no don't use that word in front of me because you're making fun of my god you're making fun of the one that gives me reason to get up every day worldly mindset we've allowed too much of that world to infiltrate our minds and affect our christian life what what point in time do we say enough's enough that this is this is it's not going to happen anymore i going to purpose in my heart to do something better I'm going to purpose it in my heart that I'm just going to be the best of me that I can be. Because too many times I'm afraid we get to looking around. This is uh, on the way up there. The first thing that, that I'd kind of thought about preaching was just talking about skipping church. And all the effect that it has, just you skipping church. How it affects our pastor, it affects other people, it affects our... All these different things. And too many times that's what we are guilty of is we hear something preached and we want to think in our mind... The devil will put it in our mind, or maybe you just want to do it because out, of, out of pride. Well, I sure hope Brother Donald's listening to this because he really uses Brother Ray. This this help him a lot. And instead of looking at ourselves, see the thing about that Solheim Cup when it came down to those singles matches, the U.S. was losing nine to seven. Each one of those twelve ladies had to go out and play their match. Didn't matter what anybody else was doing because if they didn't take care of their match, didn't matter. They had to take care of themselves and their match. That's all they had to worry about. You win yours, let everybody else win theirs, and the outcome will take care of itself. If we had the same mindset when it came to here, you take care of yourself. Let everybody else take care of themselves, and the outcome will come out the way it knows to be. It doesn't matter to me what Brother Eddie does. It doesn't matter to me what Brother Jim does. It doesn't matter what Brother Peter does. What matters is what I do. I'm the one that's going to have to answer for me. I'm not going to have to answer for Brother Charlie. I'm not going to have to answer for our pastor. I'm going to have to answer for me. So if each and every one of us would say, you know what, I'm going to be the best Christian that I can be, who knows what we could do? Because we do have the power. We serve the risen Savior. We have that power in prayer. We have that power to bless. We have the ability to change the world. And sometimes it starts with each and every one of us collectively saying, you know what, I'm going to be the best version of me and not worry about the world. I'm done, Pastor. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? 
head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.